Welcome back to another episode of Life Imitating Movies, weekly podcast where myself and my co-host Brad talk about weekly news stories from across the internet and the movies that we think that have already been made that resemble those stories. So, Brad, how are you doing today? Good weekend last weekend? Free donut day today? You grab yourself a donut yet? I I didn't know that, but now I will be. Thank you for the heads up. Absolutely. So I will say I stopped at Dunkin' this morning, grab, grab my free donut. Krispy Kreme is obviously doing something as well. So not to assume anything that you like donuts, not making a wisecrack there, but everybody likes donuts and everybody likes grabbing a free donut today. So maybe something to look forward to. <laughs> it is now. So let's open this episode. The question posed by me this week was, what movie pet would you like to have if you could pick one from any movie out there? And with this question, I honestly wanted to come up with a cooler answer because I picked that thinking, all right, is there a movie with a cool pet dragon or a pet rhinoceros or just something like that? And in the end, I was I was racking my brain and I couldn't come up with anything super cool. So... Instead, I went with one of the many movie dogs that are out there. And my answer was Samantha from I Am Legend, the dog companion that Will Smith has that is his companion in an empty, lonely world that is a great companion. And she helps him out and saves him from some zombies at some point, some zombie dogs. And it's just a heartbreaking scene when he has to put her out of her misery when she starts to convert. Spoilers, but... Not really. It's almost a 15-year-old movie at this point. Wow. 50, I remember seeing that movie in theaters in 15 years. Wow, that's insane. Yeah, no. Um, it's a good movie. It's a remake of uh, one of my father's favorite movies, which was uh, Omega Man with uh, Charlton Heston. All, you know, all based off of the uh, Last Man on Earth concept. So I, I enjoyed it. I thought Iron Legend was a pretty solid a solid uh, kind of remake or retelling of that story. Absolutely. So did you come up with a cooler answer? Or did you go with a movie dog or where, where did you go? Um, so first off, last week when I posed my question, you had written back, you know, dumb question. So I just want to say, you know, um, anyway, <laughs> I, I did. I, ca- I came up with two answers, but I'm only going to pick one. So I'm, I'm going to give you the other one. The other one I went with was Gremlins, Gizmo. Okay, I was like, but you know, if you get them wet, you feed them after midnight, then it's a whole big thing. So then I did go with a movie dog, but I went with a movie dog that I could solve crimes with, and that's Scooby-Doo. Who doesn't want to solve crimes with Scooby-Doo? I think you picked very two movie pets who are very high maintenance, because I thought about Mm -hmm. Scooby-Doo too, but then I thought, man, he'd always be making wisecracks and want to eat Scooby snacks all the time and lead me astray into mysteries that put me in danger. So I'm like, maybe Scooby-Doo would be a good pet to hang out with on occasion. And then Gremlins, of course, you know, you got to be very careful with those because if you feed them at a wrong time or you get them wet, then all hell will break loose. That's true. But apparently he likes Mountain Dew. I'm not sure if you saw those commercials. So, you know, two good choices. But would I personally want them as a movie pet buddy? Probably not. It's true. You just have to be very careful with how you treat them. But I feel like I feel like there's more danger with the gizmo, you know, potential. If it rains and he goes outside after mid, you're done. But Scooby Doo, man, it's not you're not just getting a pet. You're getting a career. That is true. You would get to solve mysteries for a living. So good answers. Good answers. So our first news story from the past week here is that Jaden Smith, son of actor Will Smith, and he's a little bit of an actor himself, and we'll get into that in a second, but he's opening a restaurant where homeless people can eat for free. And to me, I saw this, and this is one of those good news stories that we could always use more of, even if we weren't going through a global pandemic still, you could always just use a good news story like this where someone is using their platform or their money to do something good for other people who need it. So this just kind of warmed my heart a little bit when I saw this headline. Yeah, normally when I see Jaden Smith in any headline, my automatic is just cynical because I do look at him as one of those people, to quote uh, the great Ralph Garman, who was born on third base but thinks he hit a triple. So uh, 
I always look at him as one of those. But yeah, this is a good headline, you know, feeding LA has a pretty large homeless population and from all those failed dreams. And um, so it's like, it's a solid thing to do. And, uh, and, and I'm not gonna, I'm gonna focus on the positive And that is, you know, they have to, you know, he, they, the, the article mentions that he wants people who can afford the food to pay more for their food than what it's worth. Then we start getting into sticky wickets where I don't necessarily agree with that concept per se, but overall solid thing to do to make sure that every person deserves a meal, a good meal. Absolutely. So definitely commend him for that. And we'll kind of stick with the positive mostly on that with the story. <laughs> but we, it, it, you did bring up a good point where it's a good segue into I actually picked a double feature for this story. And the triple thinks he hit it. So Jaden Smith, the first movie that I picked that he was in, obviously a Jaden Smith movie I picked related to the story, two of them. And the first one is Pursuit of Happiness. And this is one where I think even though he was a little kid, he earned his acting chops. He was very believable as a young kid, as a young son. And whether he was just repeating lines that they told him to say and he just seemed natural in the role or he actually had some acting ability, who knows. But I think he was very good in Pursuit of Happiness. But then when you get into my other movie of the double feature, when he's a little bit older and that's After Earth, you see, okay this is where the nepotism kicks in because he is not very good in this movie. And look, there's a lot of things wrong with After Earth. It's just not a very good movie. But Jaden Smith in that especially is just, you can tell he got the part and it wasn't really based off of his acting ability. Yeah, 100%. So first and foremost, I'll say my movie was Pursuit of Happiness because it's a Jaden Smith, he's in the movie and it's a movie about homelessness. So that just, you have to pick that movie. Um, to touch on After Earth, so I had done a thing on M. Night Shyamalan not long ago where I researched After Earth and all of Shyamalan's movies. And he, he talks about how that movie was, Will Smith optioned the movie 100% so that his son could star in it. And then even on set, M. Night Shyamalan said like he wasn't the director. Will Smith kind of took over directing his son and directing the movie and everything. And Shyamalan was kind of just there for camera angles and stuff. So yeah, that movie was, was gar It's one of the few movies I have not bought because I don't like it. Well, um, that's fair. And I wanted to bring up After Earth as a talking point to talk about M. Night Shyamalan because he's a very interesting director, roared onto the scene with some of his early projects like Unbreakable and The Sixth Sense. But and I think he's making a little bit of a comeback recently, but I think when I look at M. Night Shyamalan, here's a director who's had so many chances to make a good, interesting, unique movie, and I don't think he's he's quite hit that. I think he just has gotten all the chances in the world, but just hasn't been able to capitalize. And he's because he's made some very bad movies, and like I said, maybe we're starting to see a comeback with Split and this new movie coming out that looks a little bit intriguing called Old, but... He just he's made so many bad ones and a lot of people like the village i don't really like that one obviously the last airbender was a disaster you have the happening it just goes on and on and on where he was given so many chances and so many directoral roles and some budget behind some of these movies and he just couldn't make a good movie so i'm a little wary whenever i see his name attached to a movie now so yeah there was there was a point where Shyamalan, um when the when the previews for Split came out and it said an M. Night Shyamalan film, there's a lot of reports about um, how how people started laughing in the movie theater when they saw an M. Night Shyamalan film. And that is what his name had become at that point. And then Split came. I, I, I think Split's a great movie. I think I think James McAvoy should have been nominated for an Oscar for that movie. He is phenomenal in that movie. and. Um, but to your point, do you not think his earlier movies, like, I think Unbreakable is one of the best comic book movies, origin stories ever made. So do you not think that that is a standout movie of his? Like, he was a genius in his first big movies. 
I do. I, I really like Unbreakable and I really like The Sixth Sense because if you go back and watch those now, they definitely still hold up and there's definitely still lots of layers there to unpack in each of those and hidden meanings and nods to things that happen later in the film. So I think both of those are very rewatchable. Again, the problem is I just think after that, a lot of his other movies, I think he's had a lot more failures than successes. And like I said, the jury's still out on this new movie coming out called Old. We'll see how it is if it's more split than The Happening. But I, I will say watching the trailer for that, usually when you have a movie come out, they say the director that bought you and these movies, and usually they're their most recent ones. But with them like Shyamalan, they kind of skipped over Glass when they have that in the trailer for Old. They say from the director that bought bought you split and then I can't remember the other one that they used but they kind of skipped over glass because I feel like that was another disappointment that he just didn't stick the landing in that one so it just makes me wonder how many chances this guy will get before people stop giving him work uh you know yeah to touch on glass um it was disappointing because unbreakable phenomenal split phenomenal glass I think Glass may have suffered from the fact that, so by that point in his career, he had stopped making, after Last Airbender and all those movies had failed, and those are big studio movies, he started um, financing his movies himself, which led way to um, um, the found footage movie he did, which name escapes me, The Visit, I think was what it was called. Um, and so he started financing his own movies, which led to more creative control, which led to better movies the visit the split are are in that vein then with glass he financed it himself but he didn't have you know the vast money to kind of tie up these three big storylines and it definitely suffered because of it so we'll see what happens with old but m night Shyamalan certainly a hot topic director so let's move on to our next story here all right so big story this week from from cnn was, uh, I guess, Anthony Fauci's emails got leaked or got released or something. I, I don't even know. Um, the reason I picked this story was not the content of the emails because it's political. We're, we're not a political thing or anything. It just made me think of, like, invasion of privacy. Where it's just like this man's, like, 3,000 or 10,000 of this guy's emails just got released or whatever. And it's just like what type of invasion of privacy that is in just the public life. I mean, the content of those emails paints him as a very good person, I feel. Uh, you know, if you have different political views than me, you may go the other way. But, you know, the content wasn't anything, like, earth-shattering. So it's just, to me, it's just like, what, what's the point? What was the point of releasing these emails? It wasn't even, like, there was no salacious anything in there. Right. There weren't really any bombshells or revelations or anything like that. I think this is just a story that it was a slow news week and we wanted something to talk about on the news outlets. So I don't really think there's really much of a story here. It's really, again, nothing substantial that we're in any of the emails. So let's just move on to our movie picks. You know, it sounds like you definitely took a different approach to this story than I did. So, I, I, yeah, so all the email headline and a, mo a movie that immediately popped in my head, like right away, which is why I picked it. That's usually what I go with these stories is I'll either pick a story where I'm like, I want to talk about the topic or a movie just pops in my head right away. And this was one where the the movie popped in my head right away. And that was Ed TV. Uh, if you ever saw that with Matthew McConaughey. OK, so Ed TV is basically it's about a guy. It's it's It was almost like the Truman Show and in, in that it's about a guy who becomes a reality TV star where cameras follow him around uh, 24 hours a day. This was even before Kardashians. This was before reality TV took off or anything. It was like early, mid 2000s or late 2000s, 2000s when this movie was made. Ron Howard directed it. And it's about how this man, this, this simple man, you know, blue collar guy and his life just gets turned upside down when he becomes a celebrity because he agrees to let cameras chronicle his every move. Yeah, I feel like this is a this is a plot line that sounds very late 90s, early 2000s, where everyone just sticks a camera in front of themselves and think everyone is just so captivated to watch whatever they do. So you say that this kind of was before this big wave of popular reality TV shows. Did it kind of predict the future with some of the things that happened in the movies with reality TV that came after this? I'd say because I, I at the time this movie came out, I'm not sure if if 
if the I know real world was a thing because real world came around in the early 90s. So so the concept of of watching people live their lives was was out there. You know, it wasn't wasn't a brand new concept. But like a Kardashians or or even the Osbournes, I'm not sure it was around at that point where it was sticking cameras, not bringing people to a house to chronicle them living together, but chronicling these people's actual lives. And I do think this movie kind of, even though it was a movie that kind of failed a death at the theaters or whatever, it wasn't a massive hit. I don't think you've even heard of it, I think is what I gathered from your essay. So it's it's a McConaughey movie, Matthew McConaughey, Woody Harrelson, directed by Ron Howard, uh, uh, Ellen DeGeneres is in it and everything. It's a pretty solid comedy. I didn't mind it or anything, but it definitely is. If you were to watch it today, I feel like I haven't seen it in a long time, but if you were to watch it today, I feel like you would see the the building blocks of what reality TV has become. That's fair, because I was going to say, it seems like if you are a reality TV fan these days, then maybe you might get a little bit more out of this movie than the average person. So maybe something for those type of people to watch if they really enjoy reality TV and think this would be an early, interesting look at kind of the early days of that platform. So for mine, like I said, I went a little bit different. Dr. Anthony Fauci, he's a doctor. So I went with a doctor movie. And I, there weren't as many popular doctor movies out there as I thought there were. There were, of course, some popular ones that I hadn't seen, but I went a little ABC on this because the movie I picked relating to the story was Doctor Strange. So he, he starts out as a doctor. He starts out as a surgeon and then he becomes a wizard and master of the mystic arts. So what did you think about this? Because it took a little bit for this movie to sink in when I first saw it in theaters because... Initially, I was expecting all these crazy spells and magic and all this different stuff. And if you go back and watch the movie, it's really a lot of the same type of action from other MCU movies where it's people punching each other. So what did you think when you first saw this movie in theaters or wherever you saw it? Uh, I did see it. Dude. I, I saw it. I've seen every Marvel movie in theaters. Um, I liked it. And it's exactly what you said. If you like one Marvel movie, you're going to tend to like them all. Um, there are some that are better. There are some that were are worse. I enjoyed Doctor Strange. For a second, I thought you were going to say Doctor Strange Love. And I was like, yes, because I love that movie. But uh, yeah, Doctor Strange, it was a worthy... I feel like all the origin movies aren't as good as the later ones, but you have to have them in order to get to the later ones. So it was a serviceable entrance into this character who I didn't know much about. And uh, and in order to get to like where he was in, in, in Avengers and all those movies. So so I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, I really like Benedict Cumberbatch as an actor. I think anything he does, he can do no wrong. And I was really looking forward to seeing him as Doctor Strange, too. And you're right where they kind of in these origin movies, they have to tell the story and they have to get them off the ground. And then in the sequels and later movies, they get to do more stuff that they're known for. And I think that was definitely the case with this because in Avengers Infinity War, you got to see his character do a lot more magic and spells and different things. So I think, yeah, the origin movie effect was a little bit slow, but I still liked it too. I think it wasn't maybe as strong as some of the other Marvel movies, but I definitely walked out of the theater with a good impression after seeing it. Yeah. I mean, I like the director of that one too. It's Scott Derrickson, I think. And I think he made one of the best horror movies of the last 10 years or whatever with uh, Sinister. So uh, I'm a fan of his. And the new one, Doctor Strange of them, or Doctor Strange, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse or whatever it's called, um, is directed by, going to be done by Sam Raimi. So they're, they're getting good directors for those movies. Yeah, depending on what they do with that one, I am looking forward to it. I hope they get it right because there have been movies where the concept of the Marvel movies that have come out has sounded really good and it just didn't quite live up to, I guess, my personal expectations, such as Thor Ragnarok. I might be catching some flack for that, but I really didn't like Thor Ragnarok. So I might be in the minority, but I start to see people more online mention that they didn't like it either. So maybe I'm not, but I like the concept of this Doctor Strange sequel coming out. So hopefully they do it justice. Yeah, time will tell. It's 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 a weird time we're in right now with the Marvel world because it feels like Avengers kind of ended it all. It feels like Avengers was like the end 
of a great line of movies. And now they have to, it almost feels like they have to start over with these, with, with the new story. And it's like, where do they go? What's the next bit? Is it going to be another 10 years of build up and then a massive Avengers style ending again? So another sign of things sort of returning to normal is that Costco is finally bringing back their free samples that people have been, I guess, craving for when they're shopping or whenever they go to Costco. So are you somebody who's glad about this? Not making another wisecrack, not another donut wisecrack here, but are you happy that Costco is bringing back free samples? Do you think it's too soon, too early? What do you think? I'll be honest, I'm a Costco member and my Costco has had free samples back for like six months. So I don't really, I didn't really get the story that they're just maybe certain stores brought them back earlier than others or whatever. But yeah, my Costco is, am I a person who gets free samples? Not generally. If they have mozzarella sticks, I will stop and get one, but I'm not usually like there, there are people who stand there and wait, like they'll stand there for five minutes waiting for them to cook. There's some just standing there. I'm just like, go shop. Come back. It'll be there. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly the type of people you're talking about. And even before the pandemic, I wasn't a big free samples person either, because, again, you had crowds sometimes around the stands or like you said, it depends on what they're serving. So if it's something that doesn't really appeal to me that I would never even buy, let alone try a free sample of, wasn't really interested. But if it's something good and you try it and you think, hey, maybe I should pick this up. Sure, of course. So. With my movie related to this, I think there's a very distinct one out there that you're talking about a store like Costco, this superstore, and it's a mid-2000s movie, a Dane Cook comedy called Employee of the Month. And I think this one is an okay effort. I think a lot of people don't really like Dane Cook's movies, and I'm not really one of them. I think they're okay, solid comedies. I don't think any comedy that Dane Cook stars in because he was a big early 2000s property that is really super great, but I, I don't think they're as bad as some people say. So Employee of the Month, I think, is a solid comedy. Yeah, I like Employee of the Month, which is him, Dax Shepard, and Jessica Simpson or whatever. And it is. It's exactly what you said. It's an early 2000s. Con- I, I do believe I saw it in theaters. And, uh, and exactly. Dane Cook gets a lot of crap. Even his stand-up gets crap. I think his stand up's pretty funny, if I'm being honest. You know, I haven't heard, I haven't listened to his stand up in, in years, probably, but I always found the dude to be pretty funny. And, and, um, and his movies were, uh, you know, they weren't set in the box office ablaze, but they were, they were serviceable Sunday afternoon comedies. Absolutely. I think you hit the nail on the head where there are comedy where if you see it on TV now, you just tune it in, leave it on in the background, you get a few laughs out of it. So, And I think that's perfectly fine because comedies, they're just meant to give you a few laughs. And there are ones out there that are exceptionally funny and they they have you rolling on the ground with laughter the whole time. And that's great. But a lot of comedies are just okay because a lot of jokes are taking a lot of swings and sometimes miss. So I think if you have an okay comedy, that means it's doing its job. Yeah. And, and Dane Cook is honestly, he's in one of my all time favorite comedies, which is the movie Waiting. He plays one of the cooks in Waiting. So, I mean, Dane, Dane Cook, man, give it, give it a good role. He, he can knock it out of the park. And he's also in another great thriller movie called Mr. Brooks, which I don't know if you ever saw, but he was really good in that. So Dane Cook's a pretty solid, he's, he's a solid actor. <laughs> so, solid C plus. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so I guess with my movie, I went with the movie I actually watched not long ago after not seeing it for a while, which actually it takes place in a Costco. And it's the movie The Watch with uh, Ben Stiller and Vince Vaughn and uh, and uh, Jonah Hill and Richard Aoti, I believe is his name. And it's a movie about aliens that have come to Earth. And uh, the movie, Ben Stiller plays a, a manager at Costco and the first kill happens in a Costco or whatever. And the final big scene happens in the Costco. So that's the only movie I could think of with Costco in it. But I did just recently watch it. Not the best Ben Stiller, you know, Vince Vaughn mashup. But again, just like Employee of the Month, it was serviceable. It's it's an R-rated comedy, which I, I tend to enjoy more than most. And uh, I, I, it's a funny movie. Yeah, this was a movie that I remember when it came out. It just looked okay. And I think 
it sounds like from what you're saying about it that my suspicions are confirmed where you take the actors that are in this and you let them do their thing, but it's not necessarily their best performance. It's not the best combination of actors doing their thing to comedic effect. So it sounds like it's another okay comedy, that it's not super groundbreaking. It's not horrible. It's just somewhere kind of in the middle. Right. I mean, it's, it is funny. I, I definitely would say it's worth the watch because it's, it is a funny movie and it's, you can tell there's a lot of improv in it. Jonah Hill is hilarious in it. Um, um, so, you know, Ben Still, Vince Vaughn, you're, they're always going to be good. I watch anything Vince Vaughn's. I absolutely love Vince Vaughn. And, and uh, Richard Aode, who I had never heard of before this movie, but he's like a British actor. He's absolutely hilarious in the movie. So it, it's a pretty good watch and it, it's, it's more than just like a standard comedy, you know, it's about aliens and the neighborhood watch thinks people, you know, there's a murderer on the loose, but it's really aliens. So it's, it's a good movie. All right. So the next story this week is that Amazon is going to stop screening for weed in their uh, employee hires, um, which I thought, I thought is a good thing. You know, I'm one of those people who uh, believes weed is far better than alcohol. Um, so I was like, right on. And, and I'm not a weed smoker, but one of my fears was always like, what if I, one day I just happened to smoke weed with a buddy of mine or something. And then like the next day, the greatest job, like I've been looking for comes across and they test me and I get, I don't get the job because I had weed in my cell. It was always a fear of mine. So I kind of like the direction we're going where weed just isn't as stigmatized as it once was. Right. You really wanted to pick as many hot button stories this week as possible. So, yeah, I, I don't really mind this either, because in terms of all the other drugs that are out there to test for, and some people argue that, again, like you said, maybe marijuana is on the same level as alcohol for should this really be a banned substance? Should it be legal? So that's a whole debate for a different day. But I don't really have a big problem with this either. As long as you can get your job done to the best of your ability and get what you need to get done while you're working, whether it's at Amazon or another company, then I think that's really what matters the most. Right. We're not heading towards a place where it's like you could be like boxing up somebody's, you know, toilet paper and like smoking a joint while you're doing it. It's just saying, you know, in your free time, if you happen to get high, uh, we're not going to you're not going to get discounted from the job, which I think is a step in the right direction. I didn't think this was a big hot button off topic, but I guess you did. Uh, I guess with that, I'll, I'll launch into my movie, which uh, this was one of the ones where I did pick it because of the story, because I am, it's an interest, I thought it was an interesting story. So then I, I just went and looked up, I tried to think about all the movies relating to, to, to marijuana and everything. And there are some we've already talked about, but one we hadn't talked about, which was Grandma's Boy. You ever see Grandma's Boy? No, is this an Adam Sandler movie? It was an Adam Sandler produced movie. It's got like, you know, those guys who are in all of his movies that you're like, oh, there's that guy who's in every one of his movies. Well, this movie starred those guys. <laughs> it's got Alan Covert, who's the main character. And it's a movie, it's a funny, it's a hilarious movie, really, about a a video game tester. And uh, and and he, he falls in love with the new girl at the place. And, and he... The drug dealer is a main character and everything. And it's it's a very big movie about weed. He gets high and he plays video games. That's essentially the concept of the movie. Yeah, I'll be honest. Listening to the cast list and the premise for this movie, this sounds like, again, on the same subject of this just sounds like an, an okay comedy that this probably isn't going to be at the top of my watch list even for comedies right now. Um, I, Honestly, I'd say give it a watch, dude. It's... It's pretty damn hilarious. It's better than what we just talked about, Employee of the Month and, and The Watch. It's actually it's actually a pretty laugh-out-loud, hilarious comedy. Fair enough. I might check it out one of these days. So with my story, I, Amazon, they deliver packages to homes and families. They're always ordering things off of that. So with that, I kind of ABC'd it a little bit to the movie Where the Millers because the main character played by Jason Sudeikis is a drug dealer. And there's this whole deal that goes down that he needs to find fake family members to pose with to get across borders and deliver a large supply of marijuana. So I thought this might fit in a little bit with the story. And 
I really think not to trash Grandma's Boy or any of the comedies that we've already talked about, but I think out of the ones we've mentioned so far in the episode that this is definitely the best comedy so far that we've talked about this week. So I really like Where the Millers. I think it's funny. I think it has a lot of laughs that hit with the fake family dynamic and the different things that each character brings to the table. So I think Where the Millers is an above average comedy. Yeah, I like Where the Millers. And I always think of uh, the tattoo. It's one of those scenes that sticks with you when he's when he's like talking about how he has no regrets, but it's spelled regrets. And Sudeikis is always like, really, not even a not even a single letter. So I, I, I appreciated that. And that's one of those scenes that has stuck with me all the time. Whenever I see people's dumb tattoos, <laughs> always that, that's the scene that always runs through my head. So to have a scene like that that stuck with you is means the movie was pretty good. And I will agree with you. I think of the comedy movies we've discussed, that is the best of them by far. I think when we're talking about, again, underrated lead actors in comedies, like we were talking about earlier with Dane Cook, I think Jason Sudeikis is another one. I really like his style of comedy. It's kind of witty, sarcastic, maybe a little dry, but that's kind of up my alley. So when I think of movies like Where the Millers or he was kind of a co-star with Owen Wilson and Hall Pass and zany stuff is happening around him, but he kind of almost has a little bit of like a straight man personality. So I think he's an underrated comedy actor. I absolutely love Jason Sudeikis. I think the guy is hilarious. I, I love the horrible bosses movies. And if you have Apple Plus, watch Ted Lasso. It's one of the best shows to come on TV in the last five, ten years. It is, it is a phenomenal show. For people who may or may not know, June is the start of Pride Month. So this is where the LGBTQ community gets to celebrate and really bring awareness to them as a people, as a culture, and just all the things that come with it. So, you know, obviously we're going to have a little bit of a story here about it. And I do want to say happy Pride Month or whatever the, the saying is to celebrate for all the people that I know that are in that group that I really love and appreciate that. I want them to know that I really love and appreciate them. So with this story, I picked a story where the Seattle Seahawks are partnering with a lot of other Seattle sports teams in the area where they're they're walking the walk, like it mentions in the article, where they're actually doing something instead of just kind of changing their profile picture on Facebook. So they're partnering with different youth sports organizations and really trying to make an impact in the community. I thought that was a really positive, impactful story where an organization isn't just saying something that sounds good. They're actually following through and doing something for the community. Yeah. So I do have to ask, did you pick this article because you know the Seahawks are my most hated team? As a 49er fan, I absolutely loathe the Seahawks. So I thought I, I thought this might have been a little needling from you on, on, on behalf. Um, was that in it at all or no? No, not at all. This was just, again, I saw this this positive story that connected to this month-long celebration that just kicked off. We're an maybe underrepresented group of people, so I just wanted to bring this to people's attention. It wasn't a personal dig at you, but I certainly understand division opponent, a lot of rivalry, a lot of bad blood there. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a good story. Here's what I always uh, uh, question when it comes to, like, months and stuff. It's like, so the Seahawks, yeah, they're going above and beyond this month. But do they do stuff the rest of the year? Like, why do they just wait for June? Why can't they just do it all year long? I'm sure they do. We don't live in Seattle. We probably don't see as many stories related to things like this as other people that live a little bit closer. Personally, I know, obviously, we live in, in between the Baltimore, D.C. area and the DMV, as they call it. And I know I follow the Ravens on social media and I see that they do a lot of community stuff. And that just maybe because, again, I follow them and I see all this stuff that they're doing and Seattle all the way across the country. We just may not follow them as closely and see as much they're doing for the community. But I think this is an absolute necessity for a sports franchise in the city. They have to be a part of the community. If they're not, why do people come to the games and why should people care about them? If you're a sports franchise, you kind of have to do some community work to show people that we're here to help people because we're a good organization. 
if I've been to Seattle, I like Seattle. If the Seahawks were to stop being a football team, I'd be fine with that. So I think I picked this story not only to bring attention to it, but like you said earlier, to talk specifically about a movie. And I've talked about it on the show before, so we won't dwell on it too long. But I think a recent kind of, I guess you would call it a romantic comedy that brought attention to the LGBTQ community. And it's one of my favorite movies in recent years. And that's the movie Love, Simon. And I think this is a very, maybe not underrated comedy, because I don't know how the general mainstream population views this movie. But I think it's maybe a little bit underrated that it doesn't really have a lot of household name actors and actresses in it, but it's got a great young cast. It's a great movie, great story, and a great, I think, underrated soundtrack as well. But it's just, from top to bottom, I really like this movie. I think the message that it conveys is really great. So we've talked about it before. We don't have to dwell on it too long. But what are your kind of surface level thoughts about Love, Simon? I thought it was an excellent movie. I remember seeing it. Um... It's got Jennifer Garner in it, who's like one of my favorites. Um, and it played good too. It played like a mystery movie because, you know, you didn't guess who the person was until at the very end. Usually you can kind of figure out these things, but it wasn't until like the end where the person who, who, who was writing the notes or whatever it was, like you saw who it was and you're like, oh, right on. So I, it did, it played like a good romantic comedy. It played like a good mystery movie. And, uh, I, yeah, I enjoyed it. I bought it. I have it. It's a solid, solid romantic comedy movie. Um, and it led way to, I haven't watched the TV show or anything, but it's called like Love, Victor, I think is the spinoff TV show. Yeah, Love, Victor, I think has a new season coming out soon. And I just want to say as a side note, if there's any background noise that you can hear, unfortunately, they're doing some construction in the building here. So not really avoidable to pick a better spot to do this in, but such as kind of living and working from home these days. So yeah, love Victor, you know, we'll kind of leave that for a different discussion about the, cause the TV show is definitely a little bit different than the movie, but I think you're right where if you're not really a romantic comedy person so much, there's this interesting plot line of kind of solving a mystery that runs throughout it as well. So I think it has a little something for everybody. So where did you pick a movie related to this story? I just went with Sleepless in Seattle. You know, another a great, probably one of the original great romantic comedies. Um, like I said, I, I went to Seattle. That's where I went on an Alaskan cruise. Oh, I'm wearing that shirt too, Alaska. Uh, I went on an Alaskan cruise, uh, which left out of Seattle. So we took an extra day in Seattle and we went to a restaurant where we, um, we, we ate at this restaurant, which is right on the pier, and they actually have a placard where um, Tom Hanks sat and Rob Reiner sat in one of the scenes in the movie. So that was pretty cool. I took a picture with that and everything. And, and, and you know, as, as movies go, I'd say that's one of the best romantic comedies ever made. That's a pretty bold statement. This is one that I haven't really seen yet. So would you, it definitely sounds like you would, would you recommend this to somebody who hasn't seen this movie yet? Oh yeah, 100%. I mean, in the pantheon of romantic comedies, the two legends are kind of Tom Hanks, Meg Ryan. Meg Ryan also, Meg Ryan's in the best romantic comedy ever made, which is When Harry Met Sally. So it was just her just continuing with these romantic comedies. And then it's like her and Tom Hanks just became synonymous with each other. And they just they 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 just became Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan. And, and, and I absolutely love the movies. And, you know, if you're in the mood for a nice, nice, nice. I think it's Nora Ephron comedy. It's a solid movie. Good movie to watch with the lady, man. All right. So my last story is well, I don't really pay attention to boxing too much. But I saw this headline, and uh, it just made me realize how far the sport has fallen. I mean, this used to be the biggest sport in the world in the 80s, and now it's Floyd Mayweather boxing a YouTube star. And it's just like, what, what, what's happened to sports, man? What, what's going on? So in sticking with your theme of picking stories from this week, this isn't a very hot-button story, hot-button issue, but... These are two very hot button people. They're very controversial. They're very unlikable by a lot of people. So I really wish you hadn't picked this one because I don't plan on devoting any more time to talking about Floyd, Med Floyd Mayweather, excuse me, or Jake Paul 
any more than I have to because I think they're both very insufferable people. So I think you're right. I think it's maybe just the names that are really drawn to drawing these people to watch this matchup that maybe a lot of people tune in, maybe not. Maybe they just want to see them punch each other. I'm not sure, but this isn't something that I'll be watching. Yeah, I won't be watching it either. And and I'll be honest, I don't know anything about Logan Paul or his brother Jake Paul. I know that they're brothers or twins or something. I know nothing about them. I don't. I'm not one of those clickbaity people who reads headlines on these people. So I know that they are. Pretty, any YouTube star, in my opinion, is a deplorable human being. I hate them all, and TikTok star and all that crap. So I, you, that's a whole rabbit hole we can go down. Floyd Mayweather deplorable human being if you know anything about the guy and even when i was bringing this up i was like is floyd mayweather considered a great boxer or is he more of like a reality tv guy by now i don't even know the answer to that question so before we go too deep into an old man style rant on social media where <laughs> where did you go with a movie relating to this obviously there are a lot of boxing movies out there Okay, yeah, so my, my pick for this one was, yeah, there are a lot of good boxing movies out, out there. There are a couple I, I was going to pick, but I wasn't sure if you'd actually ever seen them, like The Great White Hype. So I went with a classic Nicolas Cage movie called Snake Eyes. And uh, Have you ever seen Snake Eyes? You haven't even heard of Snake Eyes. Jesus. All right, so Snake Eyes is a Nicolas Cage movie, 1998. Nicolas Cage, Gary, uh, Gary, Gary Sinise. And it's, um, it takes place in one night in a bot it's a boxing match and um somebody gets shot and killed in the arena and nicholas cage is there and he has to kind of solve what happened in the murder and it like it's a brian de palma film and so it's got like it they go back you know they show the same scene like six different times from different angles to kind of give you to kind of give you the angle of the story and everything to kind of start figuring out what happened why it happened and uh honestly this one dude it's one you should check out. It's a great movie. You seem to be a big fan of a lot of Nicolas Cage's earlier stuff because you've mentioned a couple movies on the show that he's been in before that have been some of his earlier works. I know, of course, little side plug here about you work on an episode of Whatever Happened to Nicolas Cage on the Joe Blow Movie Channel. So you seem to be a big fan of a lot of Nicolas Cage's earlier movies. I love Nicholas. I love his later movies too, dude. I mean, the guy, the guy commits like almost nobody I've ever seen before. And that's why, like, when he's made the turn to direct the video, where it's like most people are just showing up to give a paycheck, he's, his, his direct to video movies are some of the most insane movies you've ever seen in your life. And they're so good. <laughs> You're just like, I, 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 for my, you just can't help but love Nicholas Cage because. That is a dude that gives 150%. And whether he's in the biggest garbage you've ever seen or the biggest blockbuster, he's going to commit. And I love him. I think I agree with you on that. So for my boxing movie related to this story, I haven't really seen that many boxing movies when I did research for this. And I realized there were a lot out there that I hadn't really seen. Obviously, I'm missing a few from the Rocky franchise that I hadn't seen quite yet. Some of the weaker ones, obviously some of the Rocky movies are better than others, but, and we've already talked about my pick before, but my pick was Creed. And this is obviously a boxing movie that I have seen. And this is one where, again, we've talked about Creed 3 coming out and we've talked about the sequel a little bit, but I think, again, Creed is very underrated in the sense that, of course, in hindsight now we think, oh, it's a really good movie, but it had the really tough task of kind of rebooting the Rocky franchise while also starting something new. And I think in hindsight, people don't appreciate how tricky it was to pull that off and be a good movie at the same time. Yeah, I did almost pick Rocky Balboa, but I know I picked that before. Because Rocky Balboa for me is my all-time favorite uh, Rocky movie, boxing movie. Um, and Creed, you're right, had a tricky task of, of doing it. And at the time, the director, Ryan Coogler, who we've, gone on about numerous times i am i am a massive fan of that guy and because of creed really creed really laid the groundwork um but at the time he was only known for the film fruitvale station also starring michael b jordan which was a great movie but one of those movies you can only watch one time because it really infuriates you if you watch it but and then creed came out and and 
he got an Oscar nominated performance out of Sylvester Stallone, which was phenomenal. You know, he brought, it wasn't just a money cash grab, you know, Oh, let's retell Rocky, but Oh, we'll make a Creed son. This is a full out, full fleshed out story that was worthy of telling. And you can't say that a lot about franchise continuations that they're worthy of telling. Absolutely. So I'm looking forward to any and all, and I hope we get more and more collaborations between Ryan Coogler and Michael B. Jordan. But Creed is probably one of my more favorite recent sports movies that I've seen. And again, we've covered it on the show before, so we won't dwell too long about it. But I really like it. I would highly recommend it to somebody if they haven't seen either Creed movie at the start of the first one, they watch the second because they're a very cohesive story. But anything you want to say to kind of wrap up this discussion, because we probably talked about Creed to death, but that's also because it's a very good movie. Yeah, I'll just say what I think probably have said before, which is uh, Sylvester Stallone got screwed out of that Oscar. He should have won Best Supporting Actor. In wrapping up this week's episode, we're talking about our movie of the week, and that is the movie The Town. And this is one that I actually just saw for the first time a few weeks ago. I had tried to see it years back, freshman year of college. A friend of mine, we were hanging out in his room on a Friday night. There was nothing to do. And he said, you should watch this movie, The Town. It's really good. And at the time, it it had just kind of come out recently. And I fell asleep halfway through. It wasn't because of the movie. It was, I was just tired. It was a long day. So apologies, Donnie. It was a really good movie. But I, when I watched this for the first time all the way through a few weeks ago, I really liked it as a heist movie, as a drama movie, as Ben Affleck showing off some of his acting chops and John Hamm as the cop who's pursuing him. So I think this is a very well-made, very tightly knit you know, movie that has a lot of working parts and does it really well. Yeah, I absolutely love the town. It was a good pick too, because I hadn't seen it in a number of years. So I went back and watched it the other day. Um, And I I watched the, uh, the extended cut with the alternate ending. And so I'll defer to you. Are we allowed to discuss endings on the, on the town or no? I think so because town, the town came out in, I believe it was 2009 or 2010. So Again, you're talking about a movie that's 10 plus years old at this point. So if you don't want to listen to spoilers, tune out now. So I think we can talk about the movie because it's been out 10 plus years. And all right. So I watched so this. I, I don't think I'd ever watched the alternate ending before on this one. And then the extended cut runs. It's about two and a half hours. So it's about 30 minutes longer than the uh, theatrical cut. It just fleshes out the characters more and everything. But the alternate ending of this one, uh, Affleck actually dies in the end. He runs into the people. If you remember in the movie, he goes and, and, and beats up one of the guys who was like selling drugs outside his girlfriend's house at the you know behest of her or whatever. And so at the end of the movie, he turns the corner after the whole Fenway Park heist and the guy and his crew are standing there and they kill him. And uh, it, it's not, I, I didn't like that ending. I like the theatrical ending better where he lit. You want to see this guy make it the f- tangerine Florida and you want to see him live. And that just leaves a better taste in your mouth all around. And, um, and, and, and uh, yeah. So how, first off, did you watch the extended or the theatrical? I think I watched the theatrical cut then because that is not the ending that I saw. The ending that I saw, he gets away. He goes down to Florida, unfortunately, without, his lady on his arm, but that's because, of course, John Hamm is right on his tail and tracking him and trying to obviously bring him in. So I, th- I like that ending better from the sound of things. And again, yeah, it's a little bit, I wouldn't say it's a long movie because it doesn't really drag too much while you're watching it. It doesn't really feel slow or there are things where you say, can we skip past this? It's kind of boring, but it it is a little bit of a longer movie, but Don't let that stop you from seeing it again. I think it's a really good heist movie, good drama. If you're from Boston, obviously this is a movie that you should probably want to see because it really celebrates the city and the history and the people and the atmosphere. So I think people from Boston especially would really like this movie if they haven't seen it. Yeah, man, you got to be from Dorchester. But uh, it's... I, it's a, it's well for one this is your second Affleck movie that you picked so I don't know are you on an Affleck tear recently with all of his directorial movies 
You know, I realized that after I picked it and I sent you the kind of sheet markup, whatever you want to call it, for this week's episode, that Argo was a few episodes back and the town now. So I guess so. I guess I must be a Ben Affleck fan. Not that I think every single movie that he's been in, he's been a really good actor, but the ones that he's been good in, Gone Girl is one of my favorites from recent years. I think the ones that he's been good in, he's been really good. Yeah, and to touch on, because that's where the, the comparison for me is where Argo, where we talked about Argo, it had one of the best, most tension-filled endings I think I had ever seen. And then watching this, the ending, the heist at Fenway, it's again, Affleck, the director, nails edge of your seat tension, dude. Like the guy just, he's a phenomenal director, man. He just, he, that, he just nails that ending tension where you're just like, what, even if you know what's going to happen, you're still on the edge of your seat, like, oh, dude, what's happening? What's going on here? And so, and, and, and it's just a great ending. I really didn't know what was going to happen because when they have that kind of final confrontation standoff at Fenway Park where they're trying to make their exit, the, the heist crew led by Ben Affleck and the police are outside led by John Hamm, I really didn't know what was going to happen. Were they going to get away? Were only some of them going to get away? Was John Hamm going to bring them all in and that was going to be the end of the movie? I really didn't know what was going to happen. I normally don't try to guess the endings of movies because... I just think that's a recipe for disaster for trying to simply enjoy a movie. But I was left wondering what's going to happen here. So I would definitely recommend The Town if you're a fan of kind of any one of the genres that it's in. That if you enjoy a good kind of, I guess you would call it action a little bit too. But if you enjoy any of those types of genres that The Town is, I think you would definitely enjoy it. Yeah, I mean, The Town is is a movie right up my alley. And in terms of like, just your class it's a classic cops versus robbers movie cops cops and bad guys movie you know reminiscent i know a lot of a lot of comparisons were made between it and the heat and not the heat and heat the michael mann movie um and and for my money heat has the single best uh gun battle in any movie ever made but this movie with that final fenway thing it comes close man it's it's those the gun battles in these movies are are really well done yeah, and I can't help but appreciate the final set piece as a baseball fan as well, getting to see that happen to Fenway Park and then walking through the interior of it. I think as a baseball fan, I enjoyed that as well. That's true. I think a lot of Boston boys like going back to Fenway because I think it doesn't the ending of Ted, which uh, Seth MacFarlane is a Boston boy, he shot that at Fenway. So I feel like it's just it's childhood wish fulfillment. Like we became movie makers. Where, where, where can we film that? I vote all oh, Fenway. There you go. Absolutely. Thank you to everybody for tuning in for another episode of Life Imitating Movies, weekly podcast with myself and my co-host, Brad. We really appreciate you watching, listening, whatever platform it might be on. We're on Spotify, Apple. Obviously, if you're watching this, you're on YouTube. So feel free to look us up. Check out the different links of where we are. And we really appreciate everybody tuning in. Yeah, and anybody that's watching this, go ahead and check out Joe Blow Movie Emporium. That's where I do some writing, do some 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 celebrity stories, some movie stories. I think John Claude Van Damme will be dropping today on the on the or last Friday, if you will, on the platform. So gotta get my plugs in, sorry. <laughs> gotta plug your side job. So we'll be back again next week with a new episode we'll be covering. We'll be back to a new movie of the week, and that will be The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It. So in sh for short term, like The Conjuring 3. So we'll be back again next week with a new episode covering that as our new movie of the week. So hopefully that turns out to be a good one as well. Hopefully. The other two have been pretty phenomenal. Reviews for this one are pretty solid. So I'm looking forward to watching this one in a, uh, in a dark room. <laughs> Absolutely. So thank you. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in and we'll see you next week.